and welcome to Heliotropes. My name is Julia. And my name's Kojo. And we're back. <laughs> we're back. For now. Yes, for now. <laughs> After long awaited absence, a lot's happened since uh <laughs> since our last podcast on the elections in Nicaragua, which were mm-hmm. was that in January? I don't remember, months ago. Yeah, earlier this year, twenty twenty. Um What's happened? Quick recap. A war has started between Russia and Ukraine. Um, Will Smith slapped Chris Rock at the Oscars. Mm -hmm. Julia cut her hair. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) I changed my wardrobe because it takes too long to figure out what I'm going to wear before we start these. So I'm just going to come in with what I got now. We'll see how that looks. No one commented on my wardrobe, so it must not matter. But, you know, if you think that I should go back to looking all dapper, or at least putting effort into what I'm wearing for this, say so in the comments. Let us know. You know. If you think I should do that, you really don't need to comment, because I probably <laughs> don't care. <laughs> Bet. So, <clears throat> I get, you know, without further ado... We have a lot to dive into, so we're going to dive into that. Where do you want to start? Go for it. Wherever you would like to. Start. I mean, we can start with uh, Ukraine. Seem that seems pretty significant. Um, and I guess I'm curious again where y'all fall on the spectrum of opinions as far as Ukraine and Russia, uh, NATO, United States. Let us know in the comments. Personally. Um, <laughs> I'm not pro-Russia in this stance. In this case, definitely not pro-NATO. Uh, I think if you look at the series of events leading up to these provocations, uh, it's pretty clear <laughs> pretty clear that while Russia is definitely wrong for invading Ukraine, um, the U.S. has played a key role in antagonizing Russia pretty thoroughly since the fall of the Berlin Wall in uh, what was that in 89 since the collapse of the soviet union officially in 91 a series of nato expansions uh eastward uh lithuania poland in the last round um i mean just you know actually i don't even think poland was in the last round um but culminating recently in like these uh, attempts to and by recently i mean since like 2008 is how long it's been since NATO has uh, approved of um, Ukraine and Georgia, the country's participation, membership in uh, NATO. So they're not members of NATO, but that's how long it's been since NATO approved them as eligible to join. And for y'all who don't get it, I mean, it's just, it's sphere of influence politics. John Mearsheimer, um, he's one of the names that blew up on uh, YouTube, and I mean blew up in the sense that, like, you know, in the way that academics blow up, <laughs> you know, he's not viral or anything, but he's been a great source of um, this kind of perspective on the ways in which NATO antagonism spearheaded by the United States has led to this conflict, and he's been talking about it for over a decade. Uh, longer, he's just been on YouTube for over a decade talking about it, so... A lot of people have been looking at uh, what he's been talking about, and that's a good resource. John Mearsheimer, M E A R (laughs) Scheimer. And, (laughs) you know, so y'all can check that out. What's your understanding of the significance of Ukraine being um, not being a part of NATO, but being recognized by NATO in this whole? situation well i mean i would say i mean that recognition as part of a formal process of um membership right um and it's like approval recognition i don't know what the correct or the best term to use in this case is but it's just you know that whole idea that all of the states that have joined nato so far and if you look at a map of eastern europe right all of these former soviet satellites and here's where we get into sphere of influence politics, uh, real politique. And again, this is one of the things that uh, John Mearsheimer does a good job of putting into context is that like every 
or since uh, like World War Two, right? Since really you could argue World War One, but definitely since World War Two, um, global geopolitics has been cast in the light of in several different lights. It's taken on several major characters, right? After World War Two, the world was a bipolar world, right? The two major powers being the Poles were the United States and the Soviet Union, right? So everything that happened geopolitically, whether it was between those two or, you know, all of the proxy conflicts or even just the non-aligned countries like Ghana and like a lot of other countries, countries that didn't explicitly choose a side, all of that stuff, all the politics, the macro politics of countries were cast in the light of what was going on between those two poles. Soviet Union collapses and then there we are in a unipolar world, right? And that just to, that's just to say that since one of the major powers collapsed, now the United States is the dominant power. And by now, I mean from 1991, roughly till, roughly till today, right? Uh, you could say roughly till like 10 years ago, because that's when really, you know, recognition of China's uh, presence on the world stage started getting traction. 2008, you know, uh, one of those, again, like um, that's kind of when Putin started, well, being vilified in Western media um, uh, with the invasion of Georgia, right? Uh, the country. NATO says, you know, hey, Ukraine and uh, Georgia, you're approved. <laughs> yeah, like, y'all can, like, we'll consider you as members. And then, like, that year, I think it was, like, a month later, um, Russia invades Georgia, right, as a, a clear sign of saying, hey, you know, that's not cool. And the example that Mearsheimer puts into context, or gives to put this whole thing into context is uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis in, what, 62, 1962? And the whole thing there, right? Like, if y'all don't know, it was a very super tense time. Um, and it was pretty much, Cuba was not non-aligned, right? Like, 1960, Castro and folks won the Cuban Revolution. The United States immediately looked at that and said, hey, you know, like, right, so now you're gonna, like, give us a piece of that cake, right? And Castro's like, fuck nah, you know, like, y'all been up to some fuck shit in Cuba alone for, like, decades, right? L look at the state of Cuba. We had to wage a violent revolution to get you out of here, right? We're going to keep you out. The United States says, hey, that's not cool. We're going to sanction you and make sure that uh, blah, blah, blah. And then um, Russia comes in and, hey, you know, like, you're being sanctioned by the United States right now. That's hella harsh, <laughs> We're going to give you some aid. We're going to help you out, right? And Cuba's like, hell yeah, I mean, like, that's cool. And then, like, Russia's also like, you want to hold some nuclear weapons for us? <laughs> and Cuba's like, yeah, you know, like, we'll do that. Like, it's the least we could do, right, to keep these guys off our backs, the United States. Um, but the United States, you know, if you know, we've talked about the Monroe Doctrine before, right? This idea mm -hmm. that generally, you know, everything that happens in the Western Hemisphere, North and South America, including the Caribbean, very much including the Caribbean, is... America's background so like sovereign nations be damned like <laughs> you know you can't do anything because you know Uncle Sam this is Uncle Sam's territory all of it even if a country is its own country right so Cuba its own country tries to make a decision in, in the best interest of Cuba the United States says hey nah nah you can't make that decision long story short huge missile crisis it's in history read the books or articles or whatever you can study it but that's the major thing is people will look at um, Russia's actions, Putin's actions in this case and say, oh, you know, like he's a madman. He's power hungry. He's invading a sovereign nation. Like he can't do that. Of course, we must go help. But you look at the entire history, foreign policy history of the United States over the years. I mean, you don't even have to go like after World War II, right? If you look um, what we were talking about in the Nicaragua thing, like the United States has been involved in uh, Nicaraguan politics since the 1850s, right? It's ridiculous how far back this stuff goes. Uh, and a lot of those conflicts are really like proxy conflicts for U.S.-Russia conflicts. Right, right. So mm -hmm. that's the whole, I mean, that's how, that's how I see it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's also really important to point out too that the people, the U.S. government is very well aware, right, about how they're baiting Putin in this. And, I, like, I am not condoning his behaviors in any sort of capacity, really, in anything that he's done in his entire life. <laughs> but the important thing 
to like keep in mind with all the propaganda that's out there is that they knew exactly what would happen when they decided to try to like start this voting to get Ukraine into NATO, right? And as they continued to like have NATO countries basically surrounding Russia, they knew exactly what would happen. And then when it happened, they were like, oh, well, but like Ukraine's not in NATO, right? And like won't have the vote to put Ukraine in NATO to have NATO's full backing around these things. And then the United States decided that they were going to send a bunch of money, which, you know, this country needs for certain things like COVID precautions, housing, Medicare for all. I don't know, like a whole host of things, right? For what do they call it? Um, Yeah, lethal aid. So it's and like I think there's a clip, too, of Joe Biden a couple decades ago being like, oh, like. Russia's fine. The only thing that would make Putin do something is if, like, NATO expanded again. (laughs) So, like, you know, they play, like, you know, naive around these things as if they're... Yeah, like, as if they don't know or that it was a surprise. Like, it's not a surprise. They knew exactly what they're doing, and they're trying to maneuver all these things, right? Just like in Ukraine, they helped back a coup, right, in 2014. Right. So, hmm. The United States helped back a coup. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, get Yanukovych out. And mm-hmm. I would kind of push back, not, I mean, even push back, but um, further qualify this point that it's not, I wouldn't necessarily say that the United States knew. Because I think when we look at, uh, especially in hindsight, a lot of these decisions, foreign policy decisions that are disastrous uh, on the behalf of the U.S. planners, there is an inclination to say, of course, they would have known. They should have known, right? Like, we have all the information today to understand that. And they do, at any given point, have <laughs> way more information, right? They should know, right? Like, um, there are just there's a certain worldview, a certain way of understanding imperialism that you should be able to anticipate certain things. That being said, I'm sure a few people could have pred- and did predict these uh, kind of things, right? Um, but I do think there are also a lot of people who are calling for, um, and there's always a lot of people who are calling for really, you know, disastrously inclined foreign policy decisions to be made for any number of reasons, who are also very ill prepared to understand the situation as it exists in the present, let alone understand what they're calling for. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. I don't think they probably knew, like, exactly perhaps what was going on or how brutal and devastating it was going to be. However, like, I also think that they're willing to take that risk, right? right? Like, and it would be naive to think otherwise, given how much they've had this country and and media propagandizing. Is that the yeah. right conjugation of that verb? Mm-hmm. Right, about like fear of Russia, fear of um, North Korea, right, over the past, I don't know, 10 years. And I mean like really the fear of Russia for like a century at this point. Huh. But um, <laughs> like, right, they have, I mean they have, they had people on like a month ago, people thought World War Three was going to break out, mm-hmm. right? So like this whole idea that they didn't know, yeah, I mean they may not have known exactly what was going on, but they had some idea of how bad it could get. Right. And then also, like, what their plan was going to be, which is also to support Ukraine in some pretty heinous and fucked up ways, too. Because, like, also, fuck a lot of, like, the <laughs> Ukrainian politicians and, like, their whole Nazi population over there, right? I mean, like... <sighs> That's not to say that the entire population is Nazis. Yeah, no, it's of course not. I was going like... to say the only stance yeah. really to have in this is, like... With the people, both with the Ukrainian people and the Russian people, too, who were being jailed and who knows where and, like, who knows if they'll ever appear again for protesting the war or the invasion, really. And to Julia's point, right, like, about how, yeah, they, uh, the planners, a lot of the planners, right, and I guess I'll make a distinction here between, like, planners as in, like, state planners, like, Hillary Clinton, people who are vets and like actually know what's going on and have the capacity to plan and make moves. And then there's planners like some of the people in Congress who, you know, will call for things and, you know, not because they have a, well, I guess even, you know, anyway. You don't need to be smart to get elected. Yeah. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. So 
there is a degree, right? You, part of the whole, you know, again, besides the whole Azov Battalion Nazi thing, which I guess just to clarify that point real quick, um, as far as we know, it is a minority, right, of uh, Ukrainian people. It's not to say that everyone in Ukraine is a Nazi, but just like here, we have, what, the Bulu Boys or, like, whatever other, you know, far-right faction that is borderline or actually fascist, they also have theirs. I don't know how large it is. It might be larger than ours by percentage. It might not be. But the fact of the matter is, it is there. They fly, you know, mm -hmm. you know brandish their Nazi the paraphernalia. The U.S. is arming them. And the U.S. is arming them, right. And <laughs> Which, again, very similar. I was having a conversation with someone the other day. And they were like, oh, you know, blah, 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 the Taliban. If you're listening to this and you think it's you, comment. <laughs> <laughs> but they're like, oh, blah, 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 the Taliban. And like, I can't, you know, I just, I don't like them, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I mean, you don't like them because they're in power. <laughs> like, that's what it is. How did they get in power, right? That's why, right, because it's this whole thing where, you know, you know oh, you think... You're defending the Taliban, like you're gonna really sit there and defend the Taliban at me, and I'm like, nah, I'm not defending the Taliban by like criticizing the U.S. policies that put them in power, right? Like you don't like them not because you don't like them or because they're unjust. You don't like them because they're in power. So we have to look at how they got into power, and they got into power in a very similar way. Like literally, 1980s, the Soviet Union comes down to Afghanistan, starts attacking Afghanistan, which you know. Um, it's shitty, right? But, you know, again, Afghanistan was a proxy conflict. The United States, you know, the CIA came in, trained people, including Osama bin Laden, right, and members of the Taliban to fight the Soviet Union, armed them, and then, like, literally 15 years later were in war against the Taliban uh, in Afghanistan. Not because they did, well, I mean, you, you could argue that, like, 9-11, but... You know, even at this point, it's pretty clear that Saudi Arabia had, you know, I mean, it's just, I don't think that's worth arguing. But my point is, um, to Julia's point. <laughs> we're not supporting the Taliban. Yeah, we're not. Yeah. Well, that's a point. <laughs> Vehement, vehemently? Vehemently. Vehemently yeah. opposing. The Taliban. The Taliban. Right. And... And arming the United them States. <laughs> and opposing, I mean, just in general, arming and we're opposing arming and supporting far right factions in countries, right? You know, like to whether it's US wartime or not, yeah. I mean, like, really, in general, but you yeah, know, specifically, like how often do we need to be in these places? How many other conflicts are going on in the world where we could actually get involved and do some good, right? <laughs> like, if that's something we actually cared about. But no, we literally hop around the world supporting fascists, you know, like it's as a, as a military, as a government. Right? And bombing people. And bombing, right? Like kind of being fascists, you know, in some cases. So, yeah. But to Julia's original point, right? And it does, this ties back in, is that when we're talking about Ukraine and like the sacrifice, right? Like, like you said, like um, whether or not they knew for sure that these were going to be the consequences, this outcome was weighed in right it was weighted like is this worth it is it worth it for us to go and continue to push nato eastward and try to bring in ukraine is it worth running the risk that russia will retaliate and invade ukraine right and have to provide support russia no the u.s because i think well, that's another thing it's like oh no look what they did now we have to send them billions of dollars yeah and i think that's the thing right that's part of the calculated risk in the sense that the bets are hedged right because the united states could just as easily right i mean the point that john mearsheimer makes is that the ukraine is not really any street of any strategic value to the united states um like they are a major player in wheat uh natural gas you know to the world but as far as like those resources and other resources, they're not super important to us. Not nearly as important as the Middle East, as you know, the South China Sea, as um, you know, parts of Africa, right? So, um, if you approach it with that perspective, like the calculus is, um, is this worth Russia invading, right? And <laughs> if the answer is yes, recognizing that the United States is in some capacity fully prepared to not actually provide arms, right? Of course, we're going to because military industrial complex opportunity to provide new arms, especially after pulling out of money, Afghanistan. Money, money. 
you know, like we pull out of Afghanistan and then like literally two months later, three months, four months later, we're in another conflict, not in there personally, but we're supporting another conflict, recognizing again that that is just for the sake of the military industrial complex. We're not doing it out of the goodness of our hearts for the Ukrainian people, right? So that's to say that the Ukrainian people are the people who are, you know, like left on the sidelines uh, in this conflict, right? They are the collateral damage. Um, they're the remainder in this calculation of what, you know, how far do we push Russia, right? And that's really um, unfortunate, and it's also very reflective of our foreign policy approach in general. Mm-hmm. You know, is that like people are always expendable, right? Uh, as long as we can pursue our aims, even if they're frivolous, right? Because that's the other thing. Why, 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 why do we need to push NATO to Russia's borders. Well, and why does NATO need to exist? Yeah. I mean, that's really the fundamental question. But, like, if we, you know, can, like, be like, okay, well, NATO needs to exist, so the United States has another avenue for, like, exercising its power. Okay, like, I don't agree with that, but I'm not going to, you know, waste my time with that. Uh, Because, ultimately, it doesn't matter to me, right, if... NATO doesn't expand, right? Russia was in the same position. They were like, okay, cool. Like, y'all, we're not going to bother asking why you exist. You know, there's so many other questions, right? But stay over there. And then we're like, hey, you know, (laughs) how about we just come a little bit, a little bit closer? What you going to do, you know? And then like, yeah, exactly. So... Mm -hmm. No, I don't have any more thoughts on Russia and Ukraine other than... Well, okay, that's not true. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) there's lots of different pieces of it to discuss because then there's also like the refugee crisis and how Africans in Ukraine are being treated and how black and brown people in Ukraine are being treated as they're trying to flee and who's letting them in, like which countries are accepting um, refugees and who's not and like the discrimination piece there. Um, so like there's that piece that can be discussed and then the piece about that the Russia Ukraine well that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has taken up so much bandwidth and space in the media when like the US is really you know dropping bombs on Yemen and causing all sorts of issues really around the globe and when there's and the people of Ukraine are suffering I mean it, immensely um and there's people across the globe who are also suffering immensely um so there's also that you know that media question the what serves the u.s's interest question um and the ongoing question of racism and yeah Mm, i do think (laughs) i mean all of those are are things we need to attend to i think the media question right because the racism question is Uh, I mean, you know, we understand that the white power structure has a hegemonic character, right? Like, it shouldn't really be any surprise (laughs) to anyone that, one, there's Africans in the Ukraine, and two, that they face racism. You know, (laughs) like, African people in Europe face racism. African people everywhere face racism. Even And students, like, people who aren't living there, but people who are there, right, like, for school. So there's not even... I mean, that there's just such a smaller social network and connection right. in that capacity. Yeah. So, but I do want to talk about the media piece because I think that's a really, really, really important. I honestly think there's a lot of overlaps between media coverage of this and media coverage of COVID. And that's going back, right, before war was actually declared. Um, just like going back you know, kind of towards the height of the pandemic. At this time, two years ago, you know, 2020, um, very similar, like a lot of overlaps in kind of ramping up the fear and the tension around this whole thing. Also, since our last podcast, a lot of information, new information has come out around COVID, right? As far as the increased likelihood, like almost in undeniable likelihood of a lab leak, which is significant. I don't know if we've gone into that. But um, Pfizer... We've had COVID, though, since our last podcast. Have we? I think so. Well, because if the election was 
this year. I don't know. Was it this year? Oh, wow. Wow. We, yeah, okay. Then, yeah, we've had COVID. Um, Sorry, go on. Pfizer released a bunch of documents about uh, their trials, um, their research. It's really a lot. It's like thousands of pages. Um, so, I mean, that's something we can talk about in the future. But, I mean, that's just to say that the way media has been covering this from the beginning, right? Even since December. Well, I guess I won't go so much into this so we can talk about other things. Um, but that's just to say, look out, right? Be aware. We've talked about this before on the podcast uh, about uh, media sources, reliability, validity. And, you know, just listen because there's one, <laughs> uh, The Hill has done a lot of, uh, maybe The Intercept specifically has done a lot of really great reporting on the connections between million, mil, military industrial uh, complex contractors, you know, people like former defense secretaries and or, uh, generals and, you know, things like that, who are now sitting on boards of media companies, right? Uh, and I don't mean like a whole lot of media companies because U.S. media, for the mm. most part, is run by like a couple of organizations, two or three. Right, and they're sitting on the boards of these organizations, going on news programs like giving their expert opinions on why we should go to war, right? As if it's a legitimate option, right? The assumption that we need to go to war, right? The assumption that this conflict needs to be handled mis militarily, and by conflict I mean the diplomatic conflict between Russia and NATO, right? I'm not even talking about Ukraine. I'm not talking about Ukraine right now, right? That conflict needs to be resolved through military means, right? Uh, when in fact, you know, and this goes back to like the calculus and the remainder and you know, like the collateral damage that is to the Ukrainian people right now, like it's well, well, well understood, right? <laughs> Amongst uh, a lot of people who understand uh, politics and um, how to like end this conflict, that what Russia wants <laughs> is for Ukraine to be off the table for NATO joining, right? That's it. Uh, well, maybe that was it before Russia expended a bunch of resources invading Ukraine. But that needs to be on the table, right? It's like the Israel-Palestine conflict. What <laughs> uh, everyone wants, well, you know, with the major exceptions, but at least what the Palestinian people want is, um, is their right to land, is their right to return, right? Is a return to the borders of the 1967, right, UN resolution, right? Like, um, <sighs> things like that, right? Like what we want, what people want, what's needed to end the conflict is pretty clear, but it's also immediately off the table because it's not what we want as a government, right? The United States does not want a return to those borders, right? The United States doesn't care for that. The United States does not want it to be off the table for Ukraine to join NATO, right? And if those things are off the table, what does that mean? It means, <laughs> like, if you say, okay, I'm going to give you everything you want except for the thing you want, you're going to be upset <laughs> and you're going to do everything you can to make me regret that decision, right? That's it. So um, that's something that needs to be attended to. And li listening to the way media perpetuates that uh, these narratives around, oh, we need to go to war. Uh, solutions are in sending more arms. Solutions are in doing all these things and going to the gym, right? They play clips of the news all the time and the way they're really like playing up this whole refugee thing, right? Like to the point that Julia mentioned around like the racial dynamic of this. I can't remember a conflict in my adult life in which you, in which media, mainstream media specifically, has played up the refugee angle so hard. Like, mm. it used to be confined to commercials of like, <laughs> starving children, will you donate a dollar today? Mm -hmm. You know? It used to be that kind of stuff. And you see that late at night. And now, you turn on the news and the media is just like, hey, here's, you know, white Europeans. Like, oh, I saw something yesterday. Like, mother of two children speaking to camera people about, you know safety right it's not even like oh this here's a victim like a direct victim it's they are literally going into neighborhoods and being like here's a ukrainian person <laughs> you know like there's no indication that they're 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 even 
involved in the war, right? Or that their houses have been... And then they'll show you images of a shelled house mm -hmm. or a shelled building or something, right? Like the way... I mean, they call it... You could call it a psyop, but I would even just say like the marketing around this is so sinister. It's insidious and it's so effective, right? Because if you don't know what to look for, you'll just watch it. You'll be like, oh my gosh, this poor woman, she's probably... Like, had her house blown up and, you know, like, <laughs> her kids. Oh, my gosh. Her, like, you know, white children. What's their point in that story? Like, to garner support for the U.S. allowing refugees in? Or, like, what is the end point? Because I haven't, I have not seen any coverage on mainstream media. Yeah. Because I don't watch it, not because it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't really know. I, the What I would say is that the point behind that kind of specific um, storytelling is to prime people to support whatever the US they want to happen. Do. Right. Like if the U.S. Yeah. wants to take in refugees, uh, that's what's going <laughs> to happen. Don't. Right. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like I think that that's another really important thing. I mean... It's important to remember Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's stances, right, on Haitian refugees and all refugees right. um, or immigrants from Central and South America. Yeah, don't and come. telling right, telling people <laughs> not to stance. come, not to show up. And like also in general, the United States is like welcoming of immigrants or refugees is like very poor right. compared to like a lot of other places in the world. I mean, they have like quota. Well, they used to have quotas and stuff. And, you know, then they'll be like, oh, we let in all these people. But like, it's bullshit. Um, yeah, so just want to put that out there since they're, you know, going in there and showing all of these. And it's terrible. I mean, like some, like it really is. Like some of the neighborhoods, some of the cities, I mean, it's awful. Um, the destruction is awful. People have been killed. Um and also, you know, like, U.S. government workers were whipping Haitian refugees, like, mm -hmm. pushing them out of the country on their horses. So, like... Yeah. As far as the refugee crisis is concerned. <laughs> the U.S. is creating it. Yeah. Um... There's so much more. We could literally yeah. make this whole we thing about Paul. Yeah, it was the Ukraine. Yeah, we're not going to. There's COVID, Will Smith, and uh, the other guy, Chris Rock, mm -hmm. Jada Pinkett. Thoughts? So if you don't know, um, the Oscars Big were like two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And in a very similar way, <laughs> the media had like... Well, I actually, I'd wonder what the, the ratings were, the figures were, as far as how much the media benefited from this coverage over those few days versus covering the war. But, you know, assuming people needed a break from the war, this was perfect. <laughs> um, Will Smith uh, and Jada Pinkett Smith went to the Oscars. Chris Rock was hosting. He told a joke about uh, Jada Pinkett Smith and the way she looked. Will Smith laughed, and then uh, he went up onto the stage and slapped Chris Rock, and then sat back down, and then said, keep my wife's name out your fucking mouth, twice, at least. And then the media had a frenzy, and people cared about... Well, he won <laughs> an Oscar speech. after. Oh, right, 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 yeah, yeah. And he apologized to the Academy during his acceptance speech. Mm -hmm. And then he was just banned from attending the Oscars for 10 years. Right. So what are your thoughts? I'll try to be very quick. Because, like, mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of things, I don't really fucking care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, uh, you know, there's some pieces to care about, which is the fact that he got banned. Well, there's a bunch of rapists who are still, like live in the Hollywood dream, doing whatever, and nobody says anything to them, and they're white. 
Um, there's also, like, him, Apollo, Will Smith apologizing to the Academy, not to, like, his wife, which, like, I'm not, you know, like, their relationship, whatever. Like, it is maybe how they want it to be. I don't know. <laughs> I don't particularly care. Um, but his whole thing was that he was defending his wife against, um, somebody who was making a joke at her expense and her disability of having alopecia and which is I mean like I don't think there's a great understanding of what that is and I certainly don't have a great understanding of what that is but it's an autoimmune disorder so like that means that it can come with all sorts of things and one of the things is losing your hair and she's been I think pretty open about it uh in his apology he didn't like mention that once so you know it's just a question of like if that's why you did it you know like you have this huge platform to raise awareness about it and to share some information about it. Right. I'm not going to give Chris Rock the benefit of the doubt that he didn't know because uh, I don't think he deserves it. Uh, and supposedly he's been like, you know, ragging on her for years. Um, and... I mean, the media making a frenzy out of two black men in a very minor physical altercation is super fucked up um, in terms of them, like, actually slapping each other. Like, the only part of that that I think is particularly, like, noteworthy to discuss or is, like, the image that it created and how the media latched onto that. And, like, it's some of the white women being like, it was traumatizing. Like, go fuck yeah. yourselves. Like, I, like, if that is traumatizing in your life, like, damn. You know, like, I don't, it, that is just, in, like, a bananas thing to say. Like, I don't even, like, what? Anyways, those are most of, so those are some of my very brief <laughs> thoughts. So, I mean... And I do want to backtrack a little bit because I remembered you remind me of something with the white women being traumatized by the slap heard around the world is uh, the responses of our politicians and the public to war with Ukraine, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's gone through several stages. and We must murder people. Right. Slapping them? No way. Yeah. Like... It well, and I think it's right because again, here's the media thing: is like the way the media is covering um, the Ukraine story and our options, right? Like one of the things is that, um, and again, this is just if you don't know, right? Like NATO is not formally involved in this conflict because a if because Ukraine is not a NATO member. If NATO if Ukraine was, then NATO would get involved in this conflict, and presumably Russia wouldn't have invaded. Mm -hmm. Right. But for NATO to get involved in the conflict would send such a signal, right, to Russia that they would be liable to respond with nuclear force. And we should understand what that means. Mm -hmm. um, and NATO made an active decision not to give Ukraine membership during this whole process because that was one of the options that they could have taken. Right. Right. To support them. So, you know, it's not, at least in the calculus so far, <laughs> it's not worth nuclear war. They're using to, Ukraine. Yeah. I mean, that's been the whole thing. Um, but one of the things Ukraine has been calling for, because uh, they're in an existential crisis right now, like as a sovereign nation, is for the U.S. to declare a no-fly zone, right? Comment if you know what that is before we tell you. But the thing is, most people don't know what that is, right? Also, most people don't support the U.S. being directly involved in the conflict, right? Um, and I think it was The Hill who covered this, and they were talking about a poll or polls that have been done around these two things, right? Uh, the U.S. is calling for a no-fly zone. Oh, right. Um, the U.S. Do you support the U.S. going to war, uh, getting involved militarily uh, in the war in Ukraine, yes or no, right? Most people overwhelmingly don't support that. People don't want to go to war. Although that number has been climbing as, you know, America, white America, is inundated with <laughs> images of uh, refugees, right? On the other hand, right, when you ask people, because this, is, this was, right, it hasn't recently been so much in the news, but over the past couple weeks, it was pretty big. Do you, um, no fly zone, no fly, no fly zone. Ukraine wants to declare a no fly zone. 
do you support going to uh, do you support instituting a uh, no fly zone over Ukraine? And a lot more people are in favor of that, right? The idea being they're the same thing, right? For us to declare a no fly zone is for us to enforce that no planes can fly over like certain portions of Ukraine. And how do you enforce that? You do it by shooting planes down, right? That's a no-fly zone, right? So the U.S. would be going in and shooting planes down out of in the sky in Ukraine, and thus we would be involved shooting down Russian uh, things, right? That's how you start World War Three. Or patrolling. Um, right. Right, like right. in military and the U.S. military, like patrolling and then being in danger of being shot down, which would also obviously then get the U.S. involved. Right. So, I mean, again, just things to keep in mind and, you know, highlight that hypocrisy of, you know, white women. Presumably, there's some overlap between the women who are traumatized by Will Smith slapping Chris Rock. Because hitting is never okay. And the women who uh, are growing increasingly supportive of the idea of going to war with Russia. Because war yeah. is okay. Right. <laughs> so, uh, Chris Rock, Will Smith... Honestly, like, you know, again, I really could care less about bourgeois um, events, affairs, right? Uh, but I do think it's the implications of this story, right? It's how people are responding to it, how quick people have been to take sides uh, that <laughs> bothers me. Like, who are you defending? Right. So... Yeah. As far as, like, Chris Rock is concerned, honestly, I thought the joke was all... I didn't watch it. We did not. We were not watching the Oscars when this happened. So uh, I had only heard about the joke when people were talking about the event. And full disclosure, I thought the joke was much, much worse, much more explicit, much longer, much more in detail uh, in some ways than it actually was. He when I, before he heard the joke. Right, before he I actually heard the that, joke. Um, so when I heard the joke, I was like... There's got to be more. <laughs> and I looked for some clips, didn't find any, right? So I think on the merits of that joke alone, it's fine, right? Yes, it was targeted at Jada Pinkett Smith. I understand that. I don't think that's cool. I don't think most of the jokes that are made at those events are cool, whether it's at the Oscars or the Academy Awards or like the... <laughs> the same thing. Oh, shit. Uh, the Oscars, <laughs> the Emmys. Gold that's what Rose. I was thinking of. Emmys. Oh, okay. The, well, that too. Something. The EGOTs. Any of the EGOTs, you know. <laughs> and uh, the White House press, whatever. Like, shit, you know, like, <laughs> I don't care about that shit. Um, and so many of the jokes that are made at those things are heinous, right? So many of the jokes that are made in this society are heinous because so many of the jokes <laughs> that are made, right, humor in this society is routinely a vehicle for perpetuating oppression and, like, harmful behaviors and harmful ideas. So I think, one... For this to be a powder keg of something, uh, not even a powder keg of something meaningful, a powder keg of like mobilizing public opinion on a really frivolous subject, for this to be the thing, for that to be the joke, ridiculous. Like, you know, yeah, people can bash Chris Brown or <laughs> Chris Rock they for should. making <laughs> for, Chris for, Brown. for making that joke, right? But like, you cannot do that outside of the context <laughs> of all the other jokes that have been made, right? That's arguably just as racist because most of their jokes are made by white men who are never held accountable for any of these things, right? Like, for the things that they say. Or white women, because I think Amy Schumer was the co-host. Okay. And she's somebody who's like, it was traumatizing. She's also somebody who nobody should ever have to see or hear Bad. on a public setting again. So, there's that piece. And then... <laughs> There's the piece about the slap, right? The actual Will Smith going up to slap. And again, I'm not here to justify or like condemn, whatever. I think the important thing to keep in mind is that uh, Will Smith, and I think this is so important because again, my introduction to like the drama of this conflict was people talking about how like Will Smith was defending black women or how like you don't understand because like, you don't understand how important black hair is in the black community, right? Like, especially black women's hair. And, like, for Chris Rock to go up there and make a joke about a black woman's hair is, like, tantamount to, like, you know, blasphemy or, like, race traitory or whatever, you know? That is some bullshit, right? Like, that is – there's one thing, right? It'd be one thing, like Julia said, if Will went up to the stage, slapped Chris Rock, took the mic, and was like, 
this motherfucker has been making fun of black women's hair for ages, you know? We're not gonna take that anymore, right? He didn't do that. It'd be one thing if he went up, slapped Chris Rock, went back to his seat, went, got his acceptance, uh, did his speech and gave, or whatever, got his award, gave the speech, and in the speech said something, right? Again, about alopecia or about black women's hair in general, right? Or about all of these jokes targeting aimed at black women and how that's fucked up. He did not do that shit, right? So again, my grievance here is not in the actual events themselves, but the speed, the rapidity with which people took it upon themselves to connect <laughs> Will Smith's really selfish, like, thoughtless, uh, egocentric action, right? He didn't do it for the people. He did it for himself. He hardly did it for his wife, right? To connect that and make it as if it was some sort of activism. Because it was not, right? And that's the kind of shit, identity politics bullshit, that really weighs down the impact of impactful activism, right? in the public sphere, right? It weighs down the meaning of our words and our actions when we go and do anything, right? If you go and you say, oh, you know, Jeff Bezos, right? Whatever, right? Again, it's bourgeois affairs. Leave it to them, right? Don't impose activism on it because <laughs> it's not, right? There's plenty of places to look in the world where you can find good people doing great work or great people doing great work, right? Talk about those in the context of activism and the impact of the work that they're doing. Don't give it to celebrities, especially celebrities who aren't working for it, right? Like Will Smith was the face of respectability, respectability politics for so long. And now people are like, oh my God, yeah, take that respectability politics. It's like, no, no. You don't go to the person who's been promoting it the hardest. And then when he does something that, that doesn't fall in line with respectability politics, say, look, He's not taking it anymore. Yeah, respectability politics is stupid. No, it's been stupid the whole time. And this <laughs> dude who's been promoting it should not be the face of tearing it down, right? It's hardly even torn down. Again, he went up immediately for his acceptance award and apologized. And talked about, like, love in this world or some shit. Yeah, God's plan for him, you know, and the weight of vomit. it. And then released an apology. And then I think maybe apologized again, too. Maybe. It doesn't matter. We don't accept it. <laughs> you know, like... Uh, I don't know. Sorry. I think one of the other... Are you... Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think one of the other implications, too, that we talked a little bit about was... Um, I mean, not just, like, the media latching onto things, because I think we can all see why the media would latch onto that in terms of, like, what they're trying to push, but, like, also then the general public's, like, latching onto it and, like, latching on constantly to like conflict and conflict and conflict and conflict and like weighing in as if it's like necessary to weigh in and to right. defend people and to like get involved in all of these things that are really significant distractions from other things that are going on in the world globally and like communities probably in your daily life um and just like pulling attention away from that and like what that I guess means or like says about um, I guess like Western well I guess like American society or culture yeah. in that regard and I mean I'm not excluding us from that either because like we've talked about it and like um, yeah but I think it's something to definitely consider and think about yeah I mean it's this question of consumption you know, like, people immediately, like, the event happened, media took it, dressed it up, served it on a dish, and people ravenously consumed it. I mean, even before that, right? Because people who are watching it are, like, live-tweeting it right. or, like, pulling the clip off and right. then posting the clip, right? Like, well, I mean, media doesn't even need, isn't even, like, media companies aren't even the first people, like, posting or commenting anymore. Right. So... <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's this consumption thing. And it's, I, the thing that bothered me about it, again, right? Because it isn't even like, yeah, we have also consumed this content. But I think, um, yeah, as much as I'd hate to say it, but we're different. <laughs> you know, like, I think what matters here is not that you consume it, but it's how you consume it, right? It's what you're gleaning from this experience, right? Um, we could go in and 
say, oh my gosh, and go in and pick sides, what does that get us, right? What does that actually do for the world? What does that do for ourselves and our sense of our own understanding of the world, right? Nothing. It reifies a you know paradigm in which there's good and bad, right? Where there's no nuance, where we need to pick a side. And not just need to pick a side, but we need to pick a side that the media has handed us, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's how it came down. It's like people being like, Will Smith was right. He's for black women, right? If you don't support Will Smith, you are against black women. That's literally how it was. And then and people being like, Chris Rock was uh, victimized. He was brutalized. Will Smith was so wrong. And if you He support, could have killed him. He could have. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, what if he'd been oh an old God. lady? You know, like, what really? if he'd been Betty White? Y'all <laughs> yeah. y'all can die every, any day from falling on the ground and smashing your head, right? Like, nobody needs help doing that. Yeah. Especially Will Smith's self. Damn. So it, it's like that, right? People being like, oh, if you are, if you support Will Smith, then you're against free speech, right? And in these things, there are things to consider, right? Like, what does it mean for people, right? But it's things to consider that are really important because people are so dogmatic in choosing sides, right? Like, the act itself, the interaction does not say a whole lot about free speech, what says something about free speech is people going up and being like, Will Smith was 100% right. Chris Rock shouldn't have said that, right? Under any circumstances, right? And then you go back and listen to it. You're like, what? <laughs> like, that's what he said? So what does that mean for free speech, right? I can see how people would be actually concerned about that. Likewise, if people go in and they don't pay any attention to the history or the context of what's going on, I can see why people would be concerned about, you know, black women's hair and like comedians... Uh, making fun of that stuff and how this just is another episode in which, you know, black women are the butt of uh, jokes that, you know, perpetuate a sense of violence against them, right? Like, I get how people uh, would come to these conclusions, but people are really come to these conclusions not, again, for the sake of the act itself, but because of the sides that people feel compelled to take and because people zoom in. Again, the media handed us this stuff on a platter and then most people consumed it exactly the way it was handed. Right? Here are two sides, which, like, take your pick. Instead of being like, fuck that entire dish, you know? <laughs> and the place it was cooked in, right? Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> what, about, what does this say about society? What does this event itself say about society and how we need to move forward? Or how we're not moving forward? Or how we're so distracted, right? Like, we're concerned about this in the midst of, like, the burgeoning influence of World War Three, which is being promoted by the same people who gave us this dish on a platter, right? Like mainstream media, <laughs> it's the same people being like, we need a no-fly zone. And then also being like, Will Smith slapped Chris Brown, right? This is- Chris Rock. Sorry, Chris Rock. It should have been Chris Brown. I don't Brown. think, I was I gonna say, I'm Chris not Chris sure many people yeah. would complain if he slapped Chris yeah. Brown. That's not true. I'm sure Chris Brown has a lot of hardcore misogynistic fans who would complain. Yeah, I mean, if R. Kelly can, anyway. Yeah. So, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, on that or all together? Because there is one other thing I wanted to just throw out there. Or just on that for me oh, yeah, until okay. I remember something else. Okay. Go ahead. I mean, it's not about that. No, it can be about... Yeah, I mean, we can move on. All right. I mean, I there's not... This is not like a long piece, but um, I do want to just like share that the don't say gay bill has been passed in Florida, Oklahoma passed um, a law against trans athletes. So trans athletes can no longer participate in, they have to participate in the sport pertaining to the sex on their birth certificate. I think is how that law plays out. They've also passed a like an abortion ban law, which essentially is gonna like pretty much outlaw abortion. So I mean, like Oklahoma's really on one the past like ten days um, in Florida, and as we know, like that's not gonna make queer, gay, trans kids disappear or people, you know, not just kids, also adults disappear. You can't legislate, you know, people out of the world um, and it's certainly going to raise the risk. Um, we know that trans kids are a, a huge risk for suicide um, and homelessness. So, you know, if you are able to provide some sort of support and some capacity in terms of like donating to some of the 
places on the ground who are helping. Um, and there's lots of them, and I think we've probably linked to some of them in some previous podcasts, but we can um, try and find some and link to some of them there. And I don't mean to, like, the legislative causes. Like, I think those are pretty well covered in terms of, um, like, trying to push back in the courts. But I mean, like, actually to people, like, on the ground mutual aid stuff um, so that we can help keep, you know, some folks safer and so that they know that they're loved and cared for and wanted and needed in our world. Yes, they are. Yeah, and this abortion nonsense, I mean, I don't want to be dismissive about it, but it's hard for me to keep my rage in check around it. It's going to, like, keep going on and keep going on and keep going on. Um, So, you know, like, there's information out there about how to try and terminate your pregnancy if you want to. There's people out there who are going to be like stocking up on all sorts of different things to help do that, you know, and like abortion network fund. If you can donate there, please do. And do also want to note that, uh, speaking of abortion and laws, um, the honorable Katanji Brown Jackson is that her name? Mm-hmm. Has been uh, <laughs> nominated, uh, confirmed as the next Supreme Court justice to replace someone. Who? That old fucker. Right? <laughs> so um, Biden, <laughs> he followed through with one of his campaign promises uh, a black woman on the Supreme Court. We're still abolished the Supreme Court over here. Right. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, that also makes me think about Clarence Thomas and his wife who are being implicated in, like, January 6th coup things. Right. Uh, I mean, we don't need to get into all that. Oh, well, I don't even have enough information to get into all that, but... Neither. That's a thing that's going on. Yeah. It's just to say that Supreme Court seats might open up uh, under Biden. Oh, and I just want to throw this out here. The way things are looking, <laughs> not looking good for Democrats, not looking good for <laughs> Democrats at all for this year or the next two years. Yeah, for the midterms. And that has to be part of the calculus for starting a war, right? Like mm-hmm. if you're concerned about your election, your, your electability, reelectability, you're not going to wage a war that you feel like isn't going to help your numbers. Right. So, Democrats out there, I mean, it's just one of those things to think about, right? Like, there's so many people who will go to the polls and be like, yo, like, look at how well we're doing in, like, supporting Ukraine. And, you know, again, part of the whole thing is, like, we were sending Ukraine weapons, and they were amassing their weapons on their border. And, um, you know, it's one of those, they're sending the images, right? Like, Russia's responding to... Uh, or rather, Ukraine is responding to Russian aggression as Russia, you know, masses their military on uh, the Ukraine-Russia, the Russia-Ukraine border. We're seeing images of that. We don't see the images, we didn't, of like, you know, all of the uh, infrastructure, right, that was being set up on the Ukrainian side of the border, which was U.S. and German and French, like, weapons. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. But, yeah, I mean, it's dire straits um, <laughs> in the world of identity politics, in the world of bodily autonomy, in the world of, like, literal the world. Um, and there's a lot of ways to help. So, did you already say we'd put stuff in the description? Okay. Mm-hmm. Boom. And, you know, I don't want to be that guy, but, like, if you feel like donating to Ukraine, donate somewhere else. <laughs> you know, like... One, if you're donating to a large organization, chances are your donation is 99% not going to get to where you think it's going, right? It's going to pay someone um, who works at that organization and probably doesn't need the money. And then two, there's a whole bunch of other crises out there that are getting way less attention and that have been going on for a lot longer and a lot more severe. So um, Julia will post the information she said she'd post in there. Um, if you really feel like donating and getting involved, I'll post some uh, GoFundMes for you know causes that are underserved, right? Congo stuff, 
Philippines, right? Mindanao, uh, the Lumon struggle. And like in general too, I mean, the people in your community right. who are really struggling. I mean, like gas prices are uh, so high. Going to the grocery store is so high. Rent is going up. I mean, especially in Atlanta, like, I mean, it's just, it's really out of control and people really are really struggling. So yeah, I mean, by all means, if you can spread your money, like to some of these organizations, that would be great. If you can, you know, like buy somebody a meal or if somebody's asking for money and you can give them a few dollars, I mean, that's gonna go a long way yeah. to helping people in your community. Mutual aid. Yeah. Local. It's pretty much the only way some people survive. We might have gotten under an hour. Bye. <laughs> Bye, y'all. See y'all next time.